daytime eating in people undergoing simulated night shifts improved their metabolic control. But interestingly, it also improved some measures of anxiety and depression too. All of these improvements seem to be related to improved circadian alignment. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lund, and today our guest is Greg Potter. Greg has a PhD in the Leeds University of Cardiovascular and Metabolic Medicine. His focus is on the circadian rhythms and light-dark cycles. In this episode, we're going to talk about sleep. How do you improve your sleep? How do you fix bad sleeping patterns? And what's the most optimal way to sleep in alignment with the circadian rhythms? This episode is brought to you by Alitura Naturals. Alitura brings you the best natural skincare products for radiating skin and anti-aging. Regular skincare products products are full of ingredients and fillers that actually cause more harm than good. Alitura uses only active ingredients sourced and handcrafted in Hawaii. Their products contain zero fillers. The Alitura Night Cream received the 2021 Clean Cert Beauty Awards for Best Face Cream. Alitura also has skin moisturizers, clay mask, serums and cleansers. Head over to alitura.com and use the code SIIM, S-I-I-M for a 20% discount. Greg, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Seem. Yeah, nice to be here. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, you've been on the podcast several times, maybe like two or three times already. And uh, we've always, you know, talked about circadian rhythms and sleep and time restricted eating and those things. And I think it was it's worthwhile to, you know, update or, you know, talk about the newest updates to these fields of research and, you know, health optimization. So, uh, yeah, and I think you're one of the best people to talk about it with <laughs> because, uh, yeah, like, y- I think you were one of the, like, you know, first people uh, I started to see online who do- did talk about a lot more of the, you know, circadian rhythms and uh, the concept of time restricted eating. And you obviously have a PhD in that. So, yeah, I think you're the best person <laughs> to uh, discuss these topics uh, with. So, yeah, you can maybe briefly summarize like what is you know why is such a fuss about the circadian rhythms in the first place and how does it relate to things like your sleep your health and uh, longevity overall absolutely i'll frame my answer in the context of evolution because i think that's helpful and if we think about the course of evolution then organisms obviously evolved on a planet in which there are predictable cycles in light and dark And in response to that, things like food availability, fluctuations in temperature, risk of predation, and so on. And we can think of this as being a kind of environmental clock. In response to that, organisms evolve their own biological clocks. And these produce rhythmic changes in their biology and hence behavior across different timescales to optimize their bodies according to time of day. So some examples of these that are particularly relevant would be things like the sleep-wake cycle, obviously, and we are diurnal organisms with daytime active. So our bodies are best set for wakefulness, physical activity, eating and digesting food during the daytime when the sun is up. And then at night, our bodies are suited to resting and fasting and various different restorative processes. And when you think about this, it would be very hard for our bodies and energetically inefficient to try and do everything all at once. And so these biological clocks, they separate the timing of processes that aren't really compatible with each other. That might be building new structures, such as new proteins and skeletal muscles, it might be breaking down and recycling structures. It might be clearing metabolites that have accumulated during wakefulness. And we see this in the brain, for example, the brain has its own immune system called the glymphatic system that's more active during the nighttime when we sleep. And that's one of the reasons why sleep is very important to brain health and very relevant to risk of things like neurodegenerative diseases too. And a simple way that we can bring all of this together is that optimizes our bodies for wakefulness because it's during wakefulness that we have the ability to pass on our genes. And there's an analogy that I really like that I came across recently by a chronobiologist named Till Ronenberg, who's best known for his work on social jet lag, I'd suggest. He came up with that as a construct. And he says that wake is a bit like the race in a Formula One race, for instance. And then sleep is like the pit stop. And again, just going back to evolution, 
distant organisms that were early in the history of life were probably quite simple. And they would have had sleep-like behavior, we expect. And at that time, the pit stop didn't need to be that sophisticated. It probably just fulfilled some quite simple functions. But then as organisms have become more complex, think of human beings, we're enormously complex, the pit stop has become more sophisticated. And so now we have this pit stop that is the sleep period in which all sorts of different things go on in different bodily tissues. But the net result is that when we sleep well, we have sufficient sleep. And when we sleep at regular times, our bodies are best set for wakefulness. We then feel and function good during the day. So hopefully that puts some of this into perspective. And obviously we can speak about the intricacies of different bodily systems and some of the clocks that are in those systems and some of the things that they influence, but hopefully that tees up the rest of the conversation. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, sleep is such a risky thing to do. And, uh, you know, if you're an organism, then uh, if you are, if you do have a sleep cycle and, um, you know, regular sleep times built into your, like, let's say physiology or like requirement for the sleep is built into a physiology, then yeah, like, it means that it's important in a lot of ways that, you know, otherwise you wouldn't kind of do it that much. Um, and so, yeah. And, um, but yeah, like, let's talk about, you know, what is, what, like, yeah, like, why do we sleep or like, what are the consequences of not sleeping? Like, obviously everyone sleeps, every human, if you don't sleep, you will, you know, you will die within like weeks. So uh, what is the reason why do we have to sleep in the first place of, you know, what are the health consequences of not sleeping or sleeping not, not, not long enough, for example? Yeah. So the way that I would frame this is that we sleep to optimize our bodies for wakefulness. But what you're asking is what happens when we don't sleep? And we can also think about what happens when we don't have good quality sleep health. And mm -hmm. when I say sleep health, what I'm referring to really is several different dimensions of sleep that independently predict risk of various different chronic diseases, but also that in combination, probably more strongly influence our health than any one of those factors. And those dimensions of sleep health would be sleep duration, which I think historically has got the most attention, both from the research community, but also in public discourse, sleep quality. And that actually comprises several different things. One aspect of that is how quickly do you fall asleep at the start of the night? One is how frequently do you wake and for how long during the night? We can then start to look at things like the architecture of sleep, the different stage of sleep that we cycle through and how those are strung together. We can also think about some specific components of sleep, such as how well we breathe during that period because obstructive sleep apnea, which we might come back to, now is thought to affect more than a billion middle-aged adults worldwide. And it has all sorts of consequences in terms of cardiometabolic risk, but also things like daytime function, how sleepy you are, and therefore how likely you are to fall asleep at the wheel, for example. And then we can also consider the timing of sleep. And probably the most useful way to think about that is relative to an individual's biological clock. And as an example, consider shift workers who are often trying to sleep at a time when their clocks are promoting wakefulness. They're trying to sleep during their biological daytime after, say, a long night shift. And as a result, they struggle to get sufficient high quality sleep during that period. And then later on, they have to be awake during their biological nighttime when their clocks are promoting sleep. And because they haven't had high quality sleep, they haven't paid off the previous pressure to sleep that accumulated during wakefulness. And so now they feel miserable when they are awake, they're sleepy, they struggle to concentrate at work, they're prone to errors and so on. And that's actually its own sleep disorder called shift work disorder. And it's thought to affect about a quarter of shift workers. And then also there's the regularity of sleep. And this is obviously intimately interlinked with timing. And people with more regular sleep schedules are, of course, likely to get better quality sleep. And I mention that because we must recognize that these different dimensions do interact with each other. 
And when you think about sleep research, one of the interesting things to consider is that often when people have looked at sleep restriction, so they only let people spend five hours in bed when these people normally spend eight hours in bed, they might be reducing their sleep duration so they're negatively affecting one dimension of sleep health, but they're actually improving their sleep regularity at the same time. And so in some ways they're improving sleep and in some ways they're making it worse. Mm. And then with all of that in mind, we can consider these together and people have only just started doing this, but this sleep health framework was probably best fleshed out by a psychiatrist named Daniel Bicey, who's famous for generating all sorts of different helpful validated questionnaires, such as the PSQI. And he did a really nice study a few years ago in which they used machine learning to look at the predictors of cardiovascular and all-cause mortality in a large group of older adults. And they found that sleep health as this combined construct was one of the strongest predictors of people's risk of dying from all causes combined of everything they looked at. So they looked at medication use, smoking, physical activity, the list goes on. Mm. And so I can pause there if you want, Seem, but I just want to introduce sleep health because I think it's a really helpful way for people to understand what healthy sleep looks like. And then we can, if you want, now move into what happens when people either don't get enough sleep or they're entirely deprived of sleep. Or you might want to pick up on something that I just said. Mm. Yeah, it's a good pit stop, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, so, like, yeah, like sleep has you know massive impacts on all aspects of like phys physiological functions, and you know your brain is going to suffer, and your insulin sensitivity, and those things. And like you said, like just all cause mortality goes up if your sleep health is uh, worse. So, like, um, you can also yeah, like maybe tease into like what is the up like how much sleep do adults need generally and um you know how much does the quality matter so like obviously if you sleep very long but it's bad quality and you're not really getting the required let's say so yeah like i, I think i guess quest, get the question is like how much sleep do you need and is that duration dependent of you know meeting certain criteria within that time frame of the sleep i.e like certain stages of sleep uh how much and uh like how deep or something like that uh, versus like you just need to be you know like semi quick that, that even like you know the kind of drowsy light sleep is enough so like yeah like what is the requirement of getting the required amount of sleep sure and i just want to reiterate what you said at the start of your question there which is that regardless of the body system that research have looked at insufficient sleep and poor quality sleep negatively affect those bodily systems and so we don't need to dwell on that, but it's clear, for example, that different forms of poor sleep increase risk of neurodegenerative diseases, different forms of poor sleep increase risk of cardiometabolic diseases. They affect risk of immune dysfunction. And there have been interesting experiments in which people don't get enough sleep around the time of vaccination. They produce fewer antibodies in response to that. There have also been experiments where they get exposed to a virus like the rhinovirus, which is one of the causes of the common cold. And when they don't get enough sleep around the time of the exposure, they're more likely to develop symptomatic infections. It's also relevant to your physical performance during the day. And it's actually probably quite strongly relevant to your performance in many different types of tasks so whether that's endurance exercise strength of power exercise whether the task depends heavily on motor skills so this could be quite gross motor skills like serving in tennis or they could be quite fine motor skills maybe that's playing snook or something like that so with that said you ask about these different stages of sleep and how much sleep we need and then also whether the amount that we need is related to the quality of the sleep in terms of those stages. It's important to point out that our sleep needs vary across our lifespans. And also, if you look at people of a given age and a given sex, there's quite large variation between those people in their sleep needs too. So broadly speaking, sleep needs wane over the course of the lifespan. And most people tuning into this are probably in the 
18 to 64 year old category in in that category the national sleep foundation recommends seven to nine hours per night for most adults but they also recognize that some might need six hours some might need 10 hours and i'll add that we do actually know that there are some genetic variants that lead to very short sleeping phenotypes these people are exceedingly rare but there is something called familial natural short sleep where you can have entire families in which people need less than six hours of sleep per night hmm. and do those, those, do, those people, do those people have like a higher mortality risk or anything like that do they suffer like the side effects from the sleep or do they just physiologically need less sleep yeah, this is actually fascinating in that they physiologically need less sleep. And in some ways, they seem to be particularly resilient. Wow. And you see that in terms of their sleep and that if you deprive them of sleep, their sleep rebounds less than the rest of us. So typically, if you went without sleep tonight, Steve, and you're characteristic of most people, the following night, you would sleep substantially longer as a result of that. And also, you would have substantially more what's called slow wave activity during your sleep and <clears throat> slow wave activity is just a type of high amplitude brain wave one to four hertz so these brain waves occur one to four times per second which in terms of electrophysiology is very slow and they start around the bridge of the nose and they sweep backwards through the brain they occur during the deeper stage of sleep and they're important to various different processes such as consolidating certain types of memory but also glymphatic flow so the ability of the brain's immune system to clear out some of these waste that have accumulated during the daytime. And these people have less rebound in their sleep duration after sleep deprivation, but they also have less of that slow wave activity. As far as we know, they don't seem to live shorter lives than the rest of us. And this hasn't been well studied because there are so few of these people, but Many people anticipate that there's probably a disproportionately large number of these people in very stressful positions. These people tend to be very hard charging. And so they're the kinds of people who might end up as, for instance, CEOs, because they can cope with the workloads that the rest of us would really struggle to shoulder. Mm. There are also people who need long amounts of sleep. They need maybe 10 hours or more per night in that age group that I mentioned. And we le- we actually know less about their genetics. And it's important to recognize also that in some instances, these people are either misreporting their sleep. They say that they have 11 hours of sleep per night, but they're actually spending 11 hours in bed per night and they actually get eight hours of sleep. Hmm. Sometimes they also have comorbidities that increase their sleep capacity. And you see this in particular in certain types of inflammatory conditions because some inflammatory substances promote sleep, TNF-alpha, IL-6, and so on. But for the most part, that seven to nine hours seems appropriate for most people. With respect to sleep architecture, we can broadly divide this into rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep, which is the stage of sleep in which we have our most vivid dreams and it's characterized by these quick side-to-side eye movements, hence its name, sometimes called paradoxical sleep because while most of our skeletal muscles are completely paralyzed during the stage of sleep, basically all muscles apart from the muscles that move the eyes, the muscles that are involved in respiration and the myocardium, the heart muscle, are paralyzed, which presumably is so that we don't act out our dreams and there are actually some sleep disorders in which that mechanism malfunctions and people do act out their dreams it's called REM sleep behavior disorder but this stage of sleep seems to be very important to emotion regulation to creativity to the formation of certain types of memories too and then the other broad category of sleep stages is non-REM sleep and we can further break this down into three different stages which become progressively deeper The first is N1, which is just like a bridge between being awake and sleep. The second is N2, which makes up about 50% of a person's sleep per night on average. And this has a couple of features that are distinct to it. One is sleep spindles, these 10 to 15 hertz brain waves. 
that ripple across the thalamus and the cortex and they're very important to consolidating memories but also freeing space in the brain to learn new material and interestingly if you look between people then the number and the density of these spindles that they have is actually quite strongly related to their IQ. Smarter people naturally have more of these spindles. Mm. Another of the features distinct to this stage is the K-complex, which is the largest waveform that you would see on an EEG trace. And you can think of these as being like a detect and protect mechanism. If there's something in the environment that could wake you up, say it's a loud noise, it's like there is a decision point in your brain where it picks between either waking up or dropping further into sleep, it tries to assess whether this is actually potentially threatening. And what the K-complex does is it's triggered by that stimulus and then it temporarily deepens sleep off the back of it. And then finally, the deeper stage of non-REM sleep is N3 sleep or slow wave sleep or deep sleep, which makes up about 20% of sleep in people with healthy sleep. And this seems to be very key to many housekeeping functions. So that includes bodily restoration. It's during the stage of sleep that our bodies synthesize much of their growth hormone, which is of course key to remodeling connective tissues, but it's also important to the formation development of brain cells. For example, it has trophic functions in the brain. It is very relevant to metabolism as well. It influences substrate oxidation. And you do see changes in metabolism between these different stages of sleep. It is important to the formation of memory in the immune system as well as the brain. So if you selectively deprive people of deep sleep by basically playing a sound, for example, that jolts them out of the stage of sleep, they will show impaired immune responses in response to some sort of challenge. And it is also relevant to many other restorative processes, but I, I think that probably paints a general picture. And then the final thing that I mentioned with respect to sleep stages is, is that when you look at how they're distributed over the course of the night, we go through these cycles of maybe 70 to 110 minutes where initially you might go into N1 sleep and then N2 sleep and then N3 sleep. And then people might come back up and go into REM sleep and then go back through a similar type of cycle. It's not always that tidy, but that is a general structure that you see quite frequently. However, people who have a large amount of the deeper stage of sleep, N3 sleep, in the first half of the sleep period. And that relates to the pressure to sleep that's accumulated during prior wakefulness. And as that pressure gets paid off, people spend more and more time in REM sleep, which is strongly regulated by your body's clock. And so getting now to the other part of your question, imagine that somebody has eight hours in bed. And in one instance, they spend 50% of that time distributed between N3 sleep and REM sleep. And in another instance, they only spend 20% in those two stages combined. I would expect that the first condition would be more restorative because while all of these different stages of sleep do matter for different processes in our bodies and there is substantial overlap between them, it does seem that N3 sleep and REM sleep are particularly important to many of the things that make us human and to fulfilling sleep restorative, sleep's restorative processes. Mm. So it's yeah, like the deep sleep and uh, the REM sleep is more important. Yeah, and I, I wanna be clear that N2 sleep in particular is also important, but I do think that there's a strong argument to be made that N3 sleep and REM sleep are particularly important. And I've mentioned a couple of things that point in this direction. One is that when you see declines in N3 sleep as people get older, that strongly associates with various different types of pathologies. For example, that predicts risk of different forms of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. And there's preliminary evidence that you can intervene to help people better preserve their deep sleep as they age. 
and thereby positively affect their cognitive function and risk of some of these pathological changes. Another is that if you look across different primates, then interestingly, human sleep, probably less than most of them. And at the same time, REM sleep occupies a greater proportion of human sleep than any other primate. So we have relatively more REM sleep than all of the other primates. And it's thought that that's been very important to the evolution of our intelligence, our ability to form large scale cooperative networks, to collaborate with each other, to come up with creative solutions to different problems and so on. And again, when this has been looked at, it does seem that people who have insufficient REM sleep are prone to certain pathologies, but I don't want to be too simplistic in that there is a lot of nuance to this stuff, just as one instance. If you look at people with certain phenotypes of depression, what you find is that there's often this time course where they'll go through a period in which they have insomnia and they'll wake up very early in the morning. So you see this kind of REM sleep fragmentation at that time. And that happens alongside their mood getting worse and them experiencing some daytime dysfunction. Off the back of that, you sometimes see this REM sleep rebound where subsequently their sleep needs and capacity increase substantially. And now they spend a lot more time in bed and they actually have a lot more REM sleep than people with healthy sleep. And again, that is associated with pathology too. So it's not like more deep sleep and more REM sleep is always better. It depends on the circumstances. But if you consider people with generally quite healthy sleep, you do tend to see declines in deep sleep with age, maybe some declines in REM sleep too. And if you can do things to help preserve those, then people do seem to fare better. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. So maybe we can give like just a few bullet points. So like the average adult needs, you know, let's say seven to eight hours, maybe nine for some people. And uh, like if they do use like some sort of a sleep tracker, like the O-ring or something like that, whoop, then uh, how much of, how many like hours would it should be like a, a, like a good amount for deep sleep and uh, for REM sleep? I'll have one more wrinkle to the details, which is just that how much sleep we need does vary just over the course of say a year. You see this when people go camping, there have been these nice camping experiments by Ken Wright and his colleagues at the University of Boulder in Colorado, where people go camping in the Rockies with minimal or no access to electric light. And when you compare how long their biological night is, which is basically the time during which their pineal glands and their brains are synthesizing substantial amounts of melatonin, and you also look at their sleep between the winter and the summer, the biological nighttime and sleep are sub substantially longer in the winter than they are in the summer. It can be as much as about four, four and a half hours longer. So it might be that you sleep a bit longer during the long nights of winter than you do during the short nights of summer. You might also find that if you've been sedentary and you start an exercise training program, or if you pick up a mild infection, you sleep slightly longer than you typically do. Mm. So I just want to make it clear that it is dynamic within an individual person too. But regarding those bullet points, yeah, I would say for most people, the sweet spot is probably somewhere between seven and eight hours of actual sleep. When you look at the epidemiology of sleep, consistently the group that fares best is the group that reports getting seven hours of actual sleep per night. Hmm. And then in terms of the distribution of those stages, stage one sleep is going to minimally contribute to sleep. Stage two is going to be approximately 50%. Stage three is going to be around 20% and REM sleep is going to be maybe 20 to 25%, something like that in somebody with what most people would consider healthy sleep. I'll add one more. I'll add two more comments to that though. One is we have to bear in mind the limitations of the actual validity of these trackers and they're definitely getting better over time, but they're by no means perfect. And they generally being validated when they have been validated using participants who are young and healthy and don't have any sleep abnormalities. They don't have sleep disorders such as 
periodic limb movements during sleep. They're not sleepwalkers. Mm. They exclude people who could confound their data in that way. Another is that while historically sleep scientists and other people have thought about sleep as occurring in these discrete stages, so somebody is in deep sleep for 20 minutes at this time during the night, it's increasingly clear that actually were we able to look across the whole brain and all of its different regions, and there are dozens of these regions, then what we would find is that actually different parts of the brain are in different sleep states at any one time. And this probably helps explain various different phenomena that have baffled people for quite a long time. So one of these would be sleepwalking. In that instance, maybe the motor cortex that's involved in generating movement shows wake-like activity, whereas much of the rest of the brain shows sleep-like activity. Another would be lucid dreaming. So during lucid dreaming, perhaps parts of the brain that are involved in consciousness are showing wake-like activity, but other parts of the brain are in sleep-like activity. Another would be sleep paralysis, where around the time you either fall asleep or wake up from sleep, you're completely unable to move. You can open your eyes and look around the room, but it's like your body is still fast asleep and paralyzed. And that can be terrifying because also what you can have is some dreams intruding on your wakefulness so people might have visions during this particular state where they feel like they're being visited by some sort of hellish figure Mm. and a nice demonstration of some of the underlying physiology of this was published by Gina Poe and her colleagues last year and they did this opportunistic study where they took people who have treatment resistant epilepsy And they just happened to have had these people in the lab with an electrode placed over the cortex, this most superficial superficial and evolutionarily recent part of the brain. And they also had an indwelling electrode in the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain that's like a short-term storage depot for information. It's very important to learning each day. And what they found was that Over the course of the night, these two brain regions were scored as being in different sleep-wake states over 30% of the time. And the two regions could be in those different states for as long as 30 minutes at a time. And those are just two of these brain regions. So we have to bear in mind that we can speak about this simplistically as us cycling through these different stages, but actually it's probable that we're we're really experiencing many of these different stages at any one point in time. And this might also help explain why people experience lapses in their function during the day too. You might have kind of micro sleeps in particular parts of the brain, especially Mm -hmm. those that have been heavily taxed recently. If you've been doing something hard, learning something for a long period of time, focusing on something for several hours or so on. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you you can, you know technically even like a small break for like you close your eyes on the couch for five minutes even i mean you're not sleeping per se but your brain does recover a little bit or uh, recharge slightly or even like like a short nap as well like a 10 20 minute uh, nap can still cover cover some of the you know helps to lower the brains like let's say demand for uh, sleep slightly yeah and even a very short nap like you say can be very restorative Mm. and just 10 to 20 minutes is often enough and the nice thing about naps of that length is that you don't tend to wake up from a deep stage of sleep because if you do then you're more likely to experience something called sleep inertia which is that grogginess that you feel after a nap Mm. and so you can often immediately switch back into say your working day without feeling like you need half an hour to warm up. Because if you did take a longer nap, let's say it was 30 minutes or 60 minutes of actual sleep, you might wake up from the deeper stage of sleep, in which case you wouldn't want to immediately start driving off the back of that because that grogginess would probably impair your ability to actually drive well. And instead you want to wait, say, half an hour or so. And then just another comment on what you just said. I I do think that some of the restorative effects of some practices that have become popular in recent times probably relate to the fact that people are actually experiencing a small amount of sleep during them. 
there was some work published not long ago on yoga nidra which has been heavily popularized by some people in the last couple of years even though there's very very little actual research on it and basically when they looked at people's electrophysiology a lot of people were just having a bit of sleep during it Hmm. and so i I don't know if it would be more restorative than just having a nap and often a nap is is really what people need provided that it's not for too long and it's not too late in the day Hmm. yeah gotcha but yeah like with with regard to the requirement for the sleep and the sleep cycles so like the timing how does how important is the timing of when you sleep so like you know, humans are diurnal creatures. We're supposed to like sleep at night and stay awake at the daytime. But, you know, can you like flip it upside down, which relates to things like, you know, shift work and how healthy is that? As well as like, you know, I did this crazy polyphasic sleep schedule at one point where I had like, you know, multiple naps throughout the 24 hour cycle and I never actually slept for like, you know, any longer than three hours at one point. So like, you know, how important is the timing of when like, when you sleep and is it important to get it all in one go i know you're trying to push down your biological age at the moment team and your rate <laughs> of aging so just for the record if, if that's your goal then i definitely wouldn't go back to that polyphasic schedule yeah. well i did it i did it like i don't know five years ago <laughs> so like uh, for sure i've probably uh managed to recover from some of the damage that i did so. <laughs> yeah yeah not something that we would recommend but the timing does matter it's difficult to say exactly how much and the degree to which it matters probably varies depending on the circumstances too, but there are many lines of evidence that point in that direction. So one of them would be shift work. And we know that shift workers are at increased risk of various different health problems, whether that's coronary heart disease, certain types of cancer, even asthma. The difficulty with shift work is that there are many different things that they do differently from the rest of us. It's not just that they're sleeping at a different time of the biological day. They're also consuming more of their food during the biological nighttime. They're also exposed to more artificial light at night. They have different social interactions with other people. And frankly, keeping that shift schedule can quite negatively affect their social life. So there are all these different things that probably contribute to some of those health disparities that we see there. But there are also controlled experiments that are maybe more informative in some ways. And there are different forms of circadian disruption that have been used. One type that is very difficult to actually enforce, you need a lot of experimental control and appropriate equipment, but it's called forced desynchrony. And this might be slightly difficult for people to conceptualize, but we have these circadian clocks, circa meaning about, dies meaning day. So these clocks that produce roughly one day cycles in our biology, the melatonin rhythm being one of those, the core body temperature rhythm being one of those and so on. And they're not precisely 24 hours. They need to be reset each day. And the light dark cycle is the most important time cue and resetting the master clock in the system of clocks. But typically, the circadian system among people of roughly our age seem slightly longer than 24 hours. It's about 24 hours and 12 minutes, 24 hours, 15 minutes around there. And that's one of the reasons why it's easier traveling west than it is going east for most people. But what these experiments do is they basically enforce a light-dark cycle and a behavioral cycle that's outside of the range of entrainment that the circadian clocks can synchronize with. So seem if you're typical of most people, you might find that you, you could accurately align your body's clock each day to a light dark cycle of anywhere between something like 23 hours and 25 and a half hours. It's one of the reasons why the prospect of humans living on Mars isn't ridiculous. We could actually align our body's clocks with the light dark cycle there. Hmm. But what these forced desynchrony protocols do is they often enforce a 28 hour day. And what that means is that the human clock can't synchronize with that. And so after three of those 28 hour cycles, because 28 minus 24 is four hours, 
three times four is 12. So after three of those cycles, people are now awake, exposed to light and eating during the biological nighttime. So 12 hours out of phase with when they would normally be engaging those activity activities. So it's like if you normally go to bed at 10 p.m. and fall asleep at that time, it's like you're waking up at that time and you're having breakfast shortly after then. And what these experiments show is that all sorts of negative health repercussions ensue. And those include things like impaired blood sugar control and insulin sensitivity. You see a flipped cortisol rhythm. You see reduced heart rate variability. Cognitive performance is impaired and so on. So that's one way of modeling this question. You can also look at large scale populations of people. And we can increasingly do this with wearable devices and divide people according to how regular their sleep is. And there are many different sleep timing related metrics that we can look at. So you can look at the standard deviation of somebody's sleep. There are also things like the Gini coefficient, there's composite phase deviations, all these different measures of sleep regularity that scientists have used. And in general, what they show is that people with less regular sleep timing do tend to have worse health problems. But I just want to reiterate that what probably matters most is when people are sleeping relative to the circadian clock. And so what we really want, of course, is to sleep in line with when our clock is promoting sleep, the biological nighttime. And so just coming back down and being practical for a second, what that means for most people is only go to bed when you're actually sleepy at night. You might think that my bedtime is 10 p.m., but if 10 p.m. rolls around and you feel wide awake, you shouldn't go to bed then, even if your goal is to have regular sleep. What probably matters more is getting out of bed at a similar time each day. And while I'm not pro-alarm use for most people, they definitely do have their place, in particular in people with certain circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders like delayed sleep phase syndrome, in which people are going to bed and waking up very late relative to most people. Another is insomnia. So in treating insomnia, scientists will and clinicians will often use two different behavioral interventions. One of them is called stimulus control therapy and one of them is called bedtime restriction therapy. But in both instances, they'll use an alarm clock. They'll set it at exactly the same time each day, whether it's a work day or a non-work day. And people will be encouraged to get out of bed at that time. And one of the reasons why that's helpful is that that basically gates their exposure to when they're experiencing these time cues, zeitgebers that synchronize the clock each day, like being outside in daylight. So get out of bed at roughly the same time each day. And I think for most people, you can sleep in a bit on non-work days if you're short on sleep. But for adults, I wouldn't recommend any later than about one hour difference from day to day. And for teenagers, I'd probably increase that to two hours. So if teens have to get up at 7 a.m. during the week, I think getting up at 9 a.m. on Saturday and Sunday is probably fine for them. But for most of us, focusing on getting out of bed at the same time each morning is most helpful. And then go to bed when your clock is promoting sleep at night. And in the case of shift work, the final thing that I'll add is that where a lot of the research is going is personalizing people's shift schedules according to their chronotype. So whether they're more of morning larks or night owls and specifically removing the most strenuous shifts for each of those groups. So if you're a, an early bird, the hardest shift for you is going to be the night shift. If you're a night owl, the hardest shift for you is going to be the early morning shift. And there have been a few studies, not that many so far, but basically showing that people fare better when they exclude the most strenuous shifts. And we could speak about many different studies here, but a nice one was by Saline Vetter, who's working with Till Roneberg, who I mentioned earlier, and they did a study where they used a modified version of the MCTQ, which is a questionnaire that's used to chronotype people, to understand their chronotypes. And then they excluded the most strenuous shifts for these people. And they basically found that after a relatively short period, these people reported sleeping better, being more satisfied with their jobs and having higher quality of life as well. And so we can actually use this information about people's circadian phenotypes or their chronotypes to better personalize shift schedules. 
and ultimately help these people Im- improve their lives and their job satisfaction and probably also ward off some diseases too. Mm. Yeah. So how do you like, you know, obviously you mentioned that going to bed and waking up around the same time is important to maintain that circadian consistency. But uh, yeah, like how do you, you know, yeah. How do you, you know, first of all, like how do you maintain that? Uh, what other factors contribute to the circadian rhythm? And how do you like, you know, reset if you kind of need uh, need to do that? Or how do you start? How do you reestablish like a healthy circadian rhythm? Yeah, I'll take the example of someone who's not currently working shifts because hmm. shift work does. We can, we, we can cover it later. Like, how do you how do you like deal with it when you are shift working? Yeah, but for someone who's not working shifts and who doesn't have very unusual sleep wake timing, so they're not going to bed and falling asleep at six pm, and they're not going to bed and falling asleep at three am either. Instead, let's say they're going to bed and falling asleep at somewhere between. 9 p.m. and 12 p.m. If that's the case, then I really don't think it's that complicated. And they they can, for the most part, just go with when they feel sleepy at night, going to bed then, maybe making sure that they make some modifications to their light-dark cycle. So they're spending at least one hour outdoors in daylight each day. You can think of that as acting as a kind of anchor for your body's clock in that if you expose yourself to lots of that light, within a couple of hours after you wake in the morning, you'll tend to anchor your clock early in the day and help you fall asleep earlier at night. And for most people, frankly, that's helpful because most people don't get enough sleep in part because they go to bed quite late and then they have to wake to an alarm in the morning. At the other end of the day, if you have someone who's a very early bird, they expose themselves to lots of daylight between about four hours before they go to bed and about two hours before they go to bed, they might help shift their clock a bit later and then fall asleep a little bit later too, which can be quite helpful, particularly in some relatively elderly people who now have very early sleep wake timing but at least an hour outdoors in daylight reduce exposure to light in the three hours or so before you plan to go to bed and that might mean dimming the lights it might mean changing your light environment so that the ambient lighting looks warmer a lot of people have quite high intensity white light in their homes. They might also have sources of blue light or green light in the environment. And all of these are particularly alerting and able to move your body's clock quite potently. If you're exposed, if you're exposed to lots of that type of light in the few hours before you go to bed, you'll tend to shift your clock later, which can thereby delay your sleep. So go for so-called warm white light bulbs. Ideally, these would be relatively low in the environment. So you want your lighting to be romantic, the kind of lighting that you might have a nice restaurant, for example. And if you really wanted to, you could use blue blocking glasses during this three hour period that might help shift you a little bit earlier. And if you make some of those changes to daylight and pre-bed light exposure, a lot of people will find that they start feeling sleepy a little bit earlier and falling asleep a little bit earlier too. And if they normally wake to an alarm clock, they thereby expand their sleep opportunity and get a bit more sleep. So by shifting their clocks earlier, they can actually give themselves the chance to experience sleep's full restorative benefits. Another way of thinking about this is where you to go and just have a holiday in which you weren't going out at night and things, but you were just chilling somewhere for a couple of weeks. After those two weeks, when would you be falling asleep at night? And when would you be waking up in the morning? Because the reality is that most people have a history of insufficient sleep. And there have been some really nice experiments on this in the last few years where they've basically taken people and they've brought them into the lab and they've just let them sleep for as long as they can. So these people might be in bed by the mid afternoon and they measure their sleep from night to night. And what they find is that Initially, most people can sleep for more than 10 hours a night because they've got that history of insufficient sleep. And then after between about a week and two weeks, people's sleep stabilizes at their actual sleep need once they've paid off that debt. And on average, interestingly, they can sleep for slightly more than eight hours per night. So when you increase your sleep opportunity you might also help realize how much sleep you really need and 
when you are able to sleep too. And that type of sleep extension can be really helpful for people who have quite high quality sleep, but who don't regularly get enough sleep. So based on those changes to light exposure, setting your alarm clock as late as you can in the morning, and maybe going to bed half an hour earlier than you normally do, which you can now do and fall asleep because you've changed your light exposure. A lot of people will be able to get an hour more sleep than they habitually do. And based on all the research that's been done on sleep extension, they'll experience lots of benefits in response to that in terms of their cognition, in terms of their metabolic health, and probably in terms of some aspects of their physical performance too. Mm. So you can like make up for some lost sleep, uh, which is like many people say that you can't ever like make up for that or catch up. I I think you, you partly can. I don't think you could ever fully reverse the damage that's been done by years of insufficient sleep. Mm. But I also think it's really important to recognize that most people who have okay sleep quality do get benefits when they start sleeping more. And also you can use this preemptively too. So if seem you decided that you were going to have a kid and you knew that when you had that child, your sleep was going to suffer, you were going to lose some sleep. Your sleep was going to be more fragmented because you're looking after this little person. Then what you could do is you could try and expand your sleep opportunity for, for several weeks before the birth of your child. And that would make you more resilient to the sleep disruption that you experience. And that strategy could be very helpful in certain contexts. So think of an athlete, for example, who's traveling internationally, knows they're going to have a bit of jet lag, knows that they're going to get insufficient sleep because they're going to feel pumped and a bit anxious about the big competition they're about to participate in. Banking some sleep before that is going to benefit them. Another example would be a military context where people know they're not going to get enough sleep or a first responder unit. So think of firefighters, for instance. When you get the opportunity to, if you've got that history of insufficient sleep, expand your sleep opportunity, get some more sleep, and you cope better with the subsequent disruption. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it just makes sense. So in the short term, you're still able to, you know, uh, recover and uh, build up some resilience in advance. Exactly. And uh, yeah, like, and what what is the context of like the shift workers? Like, how how do they, like, how you know, it's you know, usually shift work is something that it's inevitable. Like, it's uh, their job, and if they can't like change their job, then uh, like, what some strategies to you know cope with that or deal with some of the uh, harm? Yeah, this is a tricky one, and I wish that I could just point people in the direction of something that helped give tailored recommendations for people according to the specifics of their shift roles and their own bodies, clocks and so on. But right now we don't have such a resource as far as I'm aware. So I'll give a few recommendations. So one of them obviously is thinking about the actual shift work organization. And I know this isn't relevant to a lot of people, but if you were in charge of such an organization, were it possible for you to influence your shift schedule so that there was some personalization removing the most strenuous shift or if you have to go through rotating shifts in general forward rotating schedules so moving from a night shift to a morning shift to a day shift as opposed to from a day shift to a morning shift to a night shift are better tolerated by most people another recommendation would be to avoid very long shifts because it's clear that Work-related errors and risk of accidents do increase substantially with increasing shift duration such that I don't think shifts over about 12 hours should be encouraged, maybe apart from in some extreme contexts. And in general, the longer the shifts you've been doing recently, the more recovery you'll need before you're following bout of shifts. So if you're working, say, three days on, three days off then obviously at the end of those three days on you need multiple days off and there are actually guidelines that have been put forward in the eu for shift workers based on some of the science that's been done so some of the recommendations that i'm providing now are basically in line with those stipulations but if we think about this at the level of the individual then 
let's say that somebody is powerless to the type of shift that they do. The goal for most people should be to try and maintain sleep wake times that are as regular as possible from day to day. So if it's possible for you to align your block of sleep at a relatively fixed window from day to day, then I definitely think you should do that. And that often is possible. So maybe there's a sort of seven hour period where actually, if you look across your shifts, that fits with all the shifts that you're doing. And then in keeping with that, you want to keep your meal timing as regular as possible from day to day too. Seem, I know that you mentioned time restricted eating earlier and this is one application of that that I think is going to be particularly beneficial for a lot of people. And there's been some really nice research on this in the last couple of years too. Some of it just showing that using time restricted eating is feasible for shift workers. Sachin Panda's lab published a great study on firefighters showing this to be the case. And when they used a self-selected eating window, it was about 10 hours they did experience some improvements to their health versus people who were just given some dietary advice, basically recommending a Mediterranean diet to those people. There was also a very nice experiment done by Frank Shear's group in which they weren't looking at shift workers, but they used the model of shift work. And they basically found that using a fixed eating window that was fixed to the daytime, so when the sun is up, was beneficial as opposed to fixing it at another time of day. Because the reality is that even during regular night shifts, most people struggle to fully align their body's clocks with those night shifts. This can happen in some rare circumstances, such as oil rig workers. So people who are working in very remote conditions where there's basically nothing to do apart from work and recover between bouts of work. But for the most part, people don't fully shift their clocks over to their shift schedules. And so with that in mind, for a lot of people actually trying to maintain that eating window, and let's say in this context, it's going to be roughly 10 hours and a regular time from day to day, which is likely going to be not too different from when they would otherwise eat, were they not working shifts, is going to be beneficial. And Frank Shear's work basically showed that this type of daytime eating and people undergoing simulated night shifts improved their metabolic control. So improved their blood sugar regulation, but interestingly it also improved some measures of anxiety and depression too. And all of these improvements seem to be related to improved circadian alignment. So these people were basically eating in closer alignment with the timing of their body's clocks too. So I think using time restricted eating. And then if you eat outside of that regular window, making your snacks relatively small, easy to digest, high in protein, low in carbohydrate, bit of fiber in there too is a good way to go. Because if you're eating during the biological nighttime, then you're going to see amplified blood sugar and possibly blood lipid responses to the meals too. So you want small, small snacks that are high in protein if you're eating outside of that window. So that might be things like cheese eggs you could consume protein bars if you're that way inclined but that type of food as opposed to things like cereal bars and large amounts of fruit and other types of carbohydrate dense items otherwise i would say in terms of your sleep obviously you're trying to keep that sleep window as regular as possible from day to day but you can also use naps judiciously and you can use them prophylactically. So you could, for instance, take a, a short nap before the start of a night shift to help support your wakefulness during that night shift. You can also use them on an as needed basis, depending on how sleepy you feel. So let's say that it's a middle of a night shift and you have a half hour break and you're just exhausted you could take an opportunistic nap at that time, even if just, just 20 minutes or so, and you will feel refreshed off the back of that. This is relevant to the end of night shifts too, because if the end of a shift rolls around and you're very sleepy and you're due to drive home, then that frankly would be unwise. 
So taking a 10 minute nap at that time before driving would be a helpful thing to do in terms of your safety. This brings up the subject of napping too, and a particular type of nap called a, a caffeine nap or a nappuccino. And you can use caffeine and naps additively. So if you really needed a jolt in your alertness, what you could do is you could consume a modest amount of caffeine. The research on this is often used about 200 milligrams, but that's quite a lot of caffeine. So maybe you only use something like one milligram per kilogram of your body weight. And there's a resource caffeineinformer.com you can go to to get an idea of the caffeine contents of foods and drinks. But you could take that caffeine, then have a 10 to 20 minute nap. And as you wake up from that nap, the caffeine will be starting to kick in. So you get an additive boost in your alertness. And then otherwise, I think using relatively modest or even quite low dose of caffeine on a regular basis as needed during night shifts and then finishing your final caffeine intake of the day unless it's safety critical by at least probably six hours before your main block of sleep is going to be a good starting point for a lot of shift workers and if you really need a, a rapid increase in your alertness you could try caffeinated gum there are some good caffeinated gums that contain about 50 milligrams of caffeine the advantage of those is that they're taken up faster because they're actually absorbed in the mouth directly as opposed to going through liver metabolism and so on. And then two other things I mentioned are exercise. You can use exercise to help you ad adapt to things like permanent night shifts. So if you were doing an extended block of night shifts, exercising around the start of the night shift is going to help you shift your clock later. And then periodically being physically active during the night shifts can acutely boost your alertness too and then finally there's the subject of lighting too i mentioned earlier that this is the main time cue for your biological clock and again trying to discuss personalized light schedules for different shift workers is beyond the scope of this discussion but what i'll say is that if you need a short-term boost in your alertness and your cognitive function you can just expose yourself to bright light for a short period. So that might be turning on the overhead lights to their highest intensity. If you have one, you could use something like a light therapy lamp. Probably needs to be at least two and a half thousand lux. Keep it about a meter from you and just keep it slightly to the side as opposed to directly in front of you. That can quite strongly increase your alertness. The downside of these is that you can sometimes shift your clock in the wrong direction depending on when you use them. But if the goal is just to acutely sharpen your brain function, then those can be quite helpful too. So I think those are the main things that we're really mostly speaking about sleep, nutrition, physical activity, and light exposure and manipulating those variables to acutely increase alertness. And then obviously when people have the opportunity to wind down from work and when they have several days without work, the emphasis really is on recovery and trying to catch up on sleep as much as possible so that you hit the next block of shifts feeling restored. Mm. Is it important to like, like, how, yeah, like, you know, exercise is also very important for health, etc. And, um, you know, if you are doing shift work or something that like, when is it better to exercise at some time of the day or not exercise at all, for example? Yeah, we, we don't really know that much about exercise timing during shift work we do know that you can use exercise timing to affect the timing of the master clock in your brain and some of the peripheral clocks elsewhere in your body too and it might depend in part on people's chronotype but in general morning exercise will help shift your clock slightly earlier so if you're a real night owl and you're trying to shift earlier that could be helpful whereas evening exercise can shift it later and those shifts can be amplified by exposing yourself to lots of high intensity light, such as daylight at those times of day too. So yes, you can help improve your adaptation to new shift schedules through appropriately timed exercise. But regardless, I would encourage people to exercise because as you say, it is very important to metabolic health. There is some preliminary research suggesting that mistimed exercise could have very small negative effects on some health parameters in very specific contexts. But honestly, I would never encourage people not to be physically active because the reality is that 
well over 90 percent of people over 90 percent of the time stand to benefit a lot from being a bit more physically active so looking to find ways to embed more physical activity into the working days of shift workers is generally a good thing and those can be so-called movement snacks so maybe it's going for a short walk after snacks that you take maybe it's taking the stairs instead of the lift it's parking further away from your workplace it's all of these different interventions that people have probably heard about previously and you can also be a little bit more targeted with a lot of these movement snacks too so if for instance you spend a lot of time sat down in front of a computer you can think about adding in some mobility exercises to counteract the type of seated posture that afflicts a lot of people nowadays because when you're constantly sat down and your thoracic spine is overly flexed and your head is poking forward and your cervical spine is hyperextended you can do exercise to help counteract that type of posture but in general i'd say the same recommendations apply to shift workers as to non-shift workers so going with government guidelines is a fine starting point resistance training for major muscle groups at least twice a week at least 150 minutes or at least 70 at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity per week or at least 75 minutes of vigorous intensity activity per week and there are additional benefits to be had by going above and beyond that and then otherwise just trying to ensure that the activity that you do is is challenging in some ways so if there's a coordination component then that's beneficial and if you can do it in natural settings with other people there are some additional advantages to be had so really many of the same rules apply. The difference for shift workers is a question of timing and maybe trying to use it to help you adjust to shift work schedules. But again, that's going to be tricky for a lot of people just because there are so many moving parts. Mm. Yeah, so it's like, you know, it's still better to exercise than not to exercise, even if it's like not the most optimal time to do so. Definitely, I think so. Mm. Uh, what about, are there like any supplements? You know, obviously melatonin is... People use a lot of that. So, like, are there any like supplements that can like either you know help to improve sleep uh, or to like you know enable to recover from some aspects of this sleep mismatch? Yeah, are we speak about shift work specifically, or just in general? Yeah, generally, like for the average person. And yeah, I mean, this is a subject that we could easily do probably fifty podcasts on, and that's no exaggeration because there are probably about that many supplements that can be helpful for sleep, and each of them could easily fill an entire episode. But what I'll say with respect to sleep supplements is you have to bear in mind the relative impact of some of these different factors on somebody's sleep. And so I'd much more quickly recommend things like using a knowledge of stimulus control of behavior to improve sleep, mm. being physically active, appropriate light exposure and so on to improve sleep as opposed to resorting to supplements but that's not to say that supplements aren't helpful in some contexts because they can be and i think for most people there are a few supplements that are likely to help sleep a little bit and there are some that probably don't affect sleep that much but i think are good for them regardless so in that category in my mind goes magnesium Frankly, the research on different forms of magnesium in sleep isn't particularly compelling. It might modestly improve some aspects of sleep, but any effects are generally quite small. Maybe people are more likely to benefit if they don't regularly consume enough magnesium. And that's true of something like 65% of people in countries such as the US. But the reason that I like magnesium is that most people will stand to benefit in many other ways from taking it. It's good for many aspects of cardiometabolic health, which in general is quite poor nowadays in most countries. So when people regularly consume magnesium, they reduce their blood pressure, they improve their glycemic control, they might slightly improve their blood lipids. And so regardless, I think magnesium is actually a pretty good choice for most people. And if they consume too much of it, all that's going to happen is they're basically just going to excrete it. And they might have a small amount of danger pants if they really go overboard which can actually be quite helpful if somebody's constipated anyway. The particular form of magnesium, it doesn't seem to matter that much. Most of the research has been done on citrate. People are very interested in using alternative forms like 3 and 8 and bisglycinate and so on, but I would just go with citrate. And in terms of a dose, 
depending on the person, I think anywhere between about 300 and 600 milligrams of elemental magnesium is a good starting point. The other ones that I, I think are <coughs> relatively widely discussed that can be helpful for common sleep complaints would be L-theanine, which is the most abundant amino acid in green tea. And you probably need 200 to 400 milligrams of it, either as one or two doses. You could just take 200 milligrams about an hour before bedtime. And it seems to help people better cope with certain types of stresses. And given that stress can profoundly negatively affect sleep, and I think is a major cause of sleep disruption nowadays, L-theanine is a good candidate. It's got an excellent safety profile, probably has some small other benefits on systems such as the cardiovascular system and on cognition too, which is one of the reasons why you'll sometimes see it in nootropic products paired with caffeine commonly. And you probably don't need to worry too much about the form, but there's a patented form of it, sun theanine, that's still relatively inexpensive that you can take. Another that is very helpful if somebody is feeling psychological distress or is experiencing other types of stress is ashwagandha. Most of the research has been done on KSM 66 ashwagandha. The dose that's used in research is almost always 600 milligrams, often as two doses, but I would just take it as one dose for simplicity. And ashwagandha is a plant that's been used for thousands of years in some parts of the world, in particular in the East, countries such as India. And that's where KSM 66 is actually sourced from. And it's actually quite a promiscuous substance. It affects many different bodily systems in many ways. But when you look at the totality of its effects, given that they include things like probably some small improvements in cardiometabolic health, improvements in reproductive function. So it consistently boosts testosterone in men. And it's probably one of the two most potent natural supplements able to accomplish that. The average effect size is such that the increase is probably around 15% in testosterone for most men after several weeks of supplementation. And related to that, perhaps, it does seem to improve some adaptations to exercise training. So people might gain muscle mass and strength slightly faster if they're taking it in conjunction with doing resistance training. It might slightly boost VO2 max too. I think the jury's out there. Seems to be relatively safe. There are a few reports of liver injury, but... I think apart from people who have some sort of overt liver pathology, so someone has fatty liver, say, they don't need to worry too much about that and instead can just go with 600 milligrams a day. Because it does affect many different bodily systems, I probably wouldn't recommend taking it for more than about 12 weeks at any one point in time, just because most of the studies haven't gone out much beyond that. And there are those reports of some minor negative issues in response to taking it. And then otherwise, <clears throat> I'll add that tart cherry juice, if available to you, does seem to consistently help sleep, probably in part because it contains a plant-based source of melatonin, phytomelatonin. The supplement that's often used is called cherry active, sometimes used in exercise science studies too, because it seems to improve some aspects of physical performance. So it can improve cardiorespiratory fitness, probably in part by enhancing blood flow during exercise. It also has some antioxidant activities that might be relevant to the health of some tissues. But again, excellent safety profile does seem to improve sleep a little bit. It is quite expensive. It's often taken as two 30 milliliter shots of tart cherry extract per day, but you can take it in other forms too. And I think there is actually a powdered form of Montmorency tart cherries now hasn't been particularly well studied or studied at all though, to my knowledge. And then finally, I'll just add that it's really important to understand that the best supplements for helping sleep depend on your sleep phenotype. So what is the source of your sleep disturbances? Mm. And what that means is that for one person taking supplemental iron is going to improve their sleep. There's a sleep disorder named restless leg syndrome that sure enough is more common in women of reproductive age because they're losing blood on a regular basis it's more common in people who have anemia and this is because it's driven in part by insufficient iron 
in certain parts of the brain, such as the substantia nigra, which is this dopaminergic brain region. And this restless leg syndrome can be treated therapeutically with intramuscular iron injections. So there's one example where most people never think of iron as being a sleep supplement. But if someone has this condition, it's a fantastic sleep aid. Similarly, if you had somebody who had class three obesity, they had a BMI of 42, and you put them on semaglutide, and over the course of a year, they lost 20% of their body weight, that might make their sleep apnea disappear because mm. now their neck is so much smaller, it's not collapsing during the night. You wouldn't think of semaglutide as being a sleep aid, but it's actually exactly what they needed to improve their sleep. Mm. And then finally, you've got to consider interactions between different substances that you're taking and always bear in mind the totality of effects of these things. Because as I was speaking about magnesium, the nice thing about magnesium is that it positively affects many different aspects of health. And so in general, you want to favor those products that also have some off-target effects that you're actually looking for, which is why if you like lifting weights and you're feeling a bit stressed out, ashwagandha is great because it just so happens to also improve how you respond to weight training. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, that's good. What about uh, melatonin itself? What's your stance on that? Like, is it something that you think is worthwhile or uh, is it dangerous or what do you think? Yeah, I think it's helpful in a lot of situations. I think it's also overused and there are some minor concerns related to it. Regarding the concerns, the main one is just that a lot of off the shelf melatonin products don't contain exactly what they claim they do. And the supplement industry has definitely got better over time. It's better regulated. There are more checks in place. Consumers are more interested in things like third-party testing of supplements. But there was a study published not that long ago where they took a bunch of products off the shelves and they just brought them into the lab and tested them. And basically the amount of melatonin in them varied from, it was about 70% less than to about 470% more than what was on the label. And some of them contain serotonin as well, which is, quite closely related to melatonin chemically, but has very different effects. So you have to bear that in mind. And based on that, I'd always go for products that have been third party analyzed. And there is a website, Consumer Lab, where people can go and find out more about how different products have checked out when they've been tested by Consumer Lab. And if you look at their melatonin page, then going by memory, products such as the Swanson melatonin products, checked out and were fine. And in general, looking across many different types of products, life extension ones pretty much always seem to contain what they claim they do. And I'm in no way affiliated with life extension, but I do like some of their products and they can they offer several different melatonin products in different quantities too. So different amounts of the active ingredient. So you could go with one of those if you were looking for melatonin. Regarding when you would use it, I personally wouldn't use it as a regular sleep supplement for most people, just because again, I think the behavioral stuff is more important, but it's particularly helpful if somebody's looking to shift the timing of their body's clock. So take the example of someone who is naturally a night owl and they're trying to fall asleep earlier. If they take melatonin roughly five hours before they've naturally been falling asleep, they're going to, pull their clock earlier and it's going to help them fall asleep particularly if that's combined with morning light exposure being physically active when they're exposing themselves to daylight as well so it's helpful for some of those circadian rhythm sleep wake disorders and those include shift work disorder if you understand where your clock is and where you're trying to move your clock to and jet lag and in the case of jet lag there's a free app available at Sleepopolis where you can get personalized recommendations regarding how to use melatonin if it's appropriate in your context. There's also Time Shifter, which is a paid app. And again, that will give you some personalized recommendations there. To shift your clock, I think a dose of approximately one milligram is right for most people. People are also interested in using melatonin for other purposes. So one of them is helping people sleep through the night. And there's a time release form of melatonin, which I actually studied a bit for my PhD called circadian. And it's got a much longer half-life than regular melatonin. The half-life of regular melatonin is about 45 minutes. And what this means is that when people take circadian, 
they better mimic the natural profile of melatonin synthesis in the body. And that better supports their ability to sleep through the night. And so this is actually prescribed for people with sleep maintenance insomnia who are above a certain age. So if you're 70 years old and you're struggling to sleep through the night, circadian might really help you if you take that around bedtime. Then there are some non-circadian and non-sleep applications of melatonin that I think are really intriguing. So some people are curious about whether they can use it as an adjunct to treat some pathologies. And we didn't get into this today. I don't think we've got time to, but there's this whole emerging field now of chronomedicine. And within that, there's chronopharmacology. And there are different subfields to chronopharmacology. One of the ideas is that if you enhance the function of somebody's biological clockwork, they're going to respond better to other treatments. And so you could potentially use melatonin as an adjunct intervention to help improve treatment responses to other things. Another subfield of chronopharmacology is basically using information about somebody's clockwork to better time the delivery of drugs and maybe some other interventions too, in order to reduce the amount of the medication that you actually need and thereby reduce side effects and cost while maintaining the efficacy of the intervention. But in the case of melatonin, I think th there might be some chronotherapeutic applications where it makes sense to use it as an adjunct. There are maybe some circadian independent ways to use it too. So one of these might be using it for its antioxidant effects. And obviously when you take melatonin, you're probably getting some of the circadian effects and some of the non-circadian effects too, regardless. But this might be very relevant to some inflammatory conditions. So there were lots of review articles about taking melatonin for things like COVID-19 around the time that the pandemic kicked in. There are also people who are interested in using melatonin to help with some metabolic issues, in part by improving clock function, but in part due to some of its non-circadian effects too. And so people have used it for things like type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, PCOS as well. And some of that research is encouraging, but there are lots of interactions that are relevant too, like interactions with people's genetics. So there's a common snip in one of the genes that encodes one of the melatonin receptors that influences the degree to which melatonin supplementation affects blood sugar control, for example. And related to that, if you do use melatonin, you don't want to consume loads of high carb foods around the time you take it. And so as a rule of thumb, I think finishing your final food intake at least two hours before you take melatonin is a reasonable starting point for most people. And then I know there are people in one of the spaces that you sometimes inhabit seem who are interested in using melatonin for its potential anti-aging effects too. Mm. And, and I think that's interesting because maybe if you're using it to improve clock function, you're having some small effects on sleep too. And you're having some of those anti-inflammatory responses to supplementation, then maybe that will sum to have some modest anti-aging effects in some people. The final application that I'll mention is for people who have very little control over their light environments. And so personally, the one context in which I would take melatonin, if I wasn't trying to shift my clock, would be if I was in hospital. Because the reality is that hospital lighting is rubbish. It's so frustrating because the food in hospitals is generally really poor and the light environment is poor. And this is precisely the time when we need to better support people's biological resilience and health. And so if you are in the intensive care unit, say, and you're exposed to constant dim lighting throughout the night and noise and so on, then I think using some earplugs for the noise, using an eye mask to block out the light and taking melatonin maybe an hour before you plan to fall asleep makes a lot of sense for most people. And... I think there's a there's a huge amount to, to be gained through that approach too, but it's still not something that's particularly widely practiced for understandable reasons. And then finally, what's the safety of it like? It's generally very good. 
when people are actually taking melatonin and known quantities of it. Mm. Some people are concerned about side effects and there are people who are concerned about any potential effects on the reproductive system and on pubertal development. And so a lot of people will not recommend it for kids. And I, I wouldn't recommend it for kids for the most part either, maybe absent certain disorders. But what I will say is that if you actually look at the clinical research that's been done, and there have been long-term studies looking at its use in conditions like autism, people respond fine to it. As far as we can tell, they don't have any obvious side effects. They don't develop differently. You can look at stages of pubertal development. There, there are these stages that were put forward by a guy named Tanner, Tanner's stages. And basically people don't seem to physically mature at a different rate when they take melatonin for a couple of years during puberty. So I'm not personally too concerned about that. And there's also no good evidence of negative feedback. When people take exogenous melatonin, it doesn't seem to shut down their body's own synthesis of melatonin. It hasn't been well studied, but the work that's been done to date tends to support what I just said. Mm. So it's, it's really interesting. And I think you can use it to improve clock function. It has some small effects on sleep that are relevant to some people. And there might be some other applications. The issue is getting the right source, using the right dose, and not becoming dependent on it because a lot of people will end up forming crutches when using things like supplements and sleep drugs. And a lot of this is just psychological and they'll feel like if they don't have access to their pill at the given time of day, they're not going to be able to sleep. And then they do struggle to sleep because of the anticipation of that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm a huge fan of melatonin as well. I don't take it like, you know, chronically or something like that, but uh, it can very be, yeah, like a very easy fix for yeah certain situations if you're like trying to trying to catch up on bad sleep or if you have some mismatch in the circadian rhythm and or if you have like infection or some sort of illness then yeah you can use it like a larger dose even to you know help with the recovery and the the sickness as well yeah yeah and you can take larger doses a lot of the studies that have used it for metabolic purposes have used larger doses maybe five to ten milligrams or so but actually, if you're trying to shift your clock around, you do want a smaller dose because the larger the dose that you take, the longer it stays in your system. Mm. And the thing with melatonin is that it has what's called a dose response curve, which is in some way similar to, sorry, it's got what's called a phase response curve, which is in some way similar to a dose response curve. The difference is that with a dose response curve, the thing that influences your response to the drug is how much you take. With a phase response curve, the thing that influences your response to the drug is mainly the biological time of day at which you take it. And with melatonin, if you're trying to shift your clock earlier, if you take it roughly five hours before you naturally fall asleep, you'll help shift your clock earlier. You'll accelerate the start of your biological nighttime. If you take it around the time that you would naturally wake in the morning, you help shift your clock later. That particular approach is not very practical, but you would actually have that particular effect. But the issue is that if you take a very large dose, so much more than, say, three milligrams, you're more likely to have the melatonin spill into the wrong part of the phase response curve. So you might be trying to accelerate your clock, but now the melatonin is in your system for so long that it's initially accelerating your clock and then later on it's slowing down your clock, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, so... Um... We're not going to cover the time restricted eating today because uh, we have done so in the past and uh, yeah it would be <laughs> pretty long uh, that's like yeah, another entire episode worth of uh, topics to discuss uh, there but uh, yeah like are there any final you know important tips that we didn't cover related to steep per se and uh, yeah like anything else people need to know yeah regarding sleep i'll mention a couple of things one is I've alluded to stimulus control a few times. And the idea here is just that our brains are very good at creating associations between things. And sometimes this is adaptive. The example I always use is if you're driving a car and you're approaching a red light, when you've been driving a car for long enough, you know that you have to brake as you approach the red light. And because you have made that association, you automatically brake without thinking about it. What happens in insomnia is that as people start to spend more time awake in bed, 
they learn to associate the bed, which is the stimulus, with being awake, which is the behavior. And they need to train themselves to reassociate the bed with sleep. And the way they do that fundamentally is by spending less time awake in bed. And so that means only go to bed when you're actually sleepy. If you've been in bed for about 15 to 20 minutes, don't watch the clock, just go by your sense of time passing. You haven't fallen asleep, get out of bed, go to a different room, do something relaxing, dim lighting until you feel sleepy and only then return to bed. Get out of bed at roughly the same time each day. So if you're having insomnia type symptoms, you might want to set an alarm clock in the morning. And mm. then during the daytime, save your bed for sex and sleep only. So don't work in bed or anything like that. Read in bed. Reading in bed for most people is fine, but if you're experiencing insomnia, it's not. And don't nap during the day because even a short nap can pay off a lot of the pressure to sleep that's accumulated during prior wakefulness. And if you nap, it's going to take you slightly longer to fall asleep and your sleep will be less deep as well. You're more likely to wake up from your sleep subsequently. Mm. So apply the principles of stimulus control of behavior. The other one that I'll mention with respect to sleep, I'll mention two, is go to the website stopbang.ca, S-T-O-P-B-A-N-G.ca, where there's a questionnaire, the Stop Bang questionnaire, which is just basically a screening tool to identify the likelihood that somebody has sleep apnea. Because if your score suggests that you might have it and you do actually have sleep apnea and you get it treated, you will feel so much better. And this is obviously enormously common nowadays, particularly as people continue to gain weight and the treatments are very effective and they don't have to involve using CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure forever. More often the treatments are dental or involve other forms of airway pressure that might be more palatable for some people. And then finally, it's very hot at this time of year in a lot of countries. And I know a lot of people are struggling to sleep in the heat. So I mentioned a few things that might help those people. One is, whereas when it's cool, it makes sense to have a hot shower or a hot bath about one to two hours before you go to bed. When it's very hot, I would actually have a cool or a lukewarm shower at that time instead, because that's going to probably slightly help reduce thermal strain on your body. And then regarding your bed, obviously sleep naked or use minimal clothing. Cotton clothes tend to help keep people cool in bed. Use a low TOG duvet, so TOG rating less than five, if you use a duvet, but you might just want to use the sheets that you normally put over your duvet instead. Your sleeping surfaces are really important and you need surfaces that help dissipate heat. So high heat storage capacity mattress, for example. And there have been some really nice studies showing that when people use these types of mattresses, they actually spend more time in slow wave sleep and deep sleep. And they feel like their sleep is more restorative too. So you might want to consider changing your mattress. And generally speaking, spring mattresses and hybrid mattresses are better than foam mattresses for that. And you also want pillows that help dissipate heat because the temperature of your forehead is particularly important to initiating and maintaining sleep because it's related to your brain temperature. So you want cooling pillows and your sleep posture is relevant too because it affects how much heat you will store while in bed. So side-lying sleep positions tend to lead to less heat storage because there's a smaller surface area in contact with the sleep surface than sleeping on your back, which is also going to exacerbate breathing issues or sleeping on your front, which isn't ideal either. So sleep on your side if possible. And then otherwise, air temperature obviously matters. Maybe you only have the option to open a window, which might help a little bit. If you have a fan, either an overhead fan or a bedside fan can help with convective and evaporative heat loss. If you have air conditioning, you can definitely use that, but fans are probably roughly 50 times more energetically efficient than air conditioning. So environmentally, I, I'd always nudge people towards fans if possible. And then you can use some technology too. So Seem, I think you probably have one of these, but you have devices like the chili pad and the ULA where people can program the temperature of the sleep surface. And so if you have the means to have one of those, then when it's really hot, that could be helpful. And actually one of the nice things about them is that you can program different temperatures for either side of the mattress. So if you and your 
bed partner have different sleeping preferences or thermal preferences, then that's great. And in general, men always want the bedroom cooler and women always want the bedroom hotter. That's certainly my experience. I think that will resonate with some people. So you could go that route. And then a, a poor man's alternative to something like that would be just doing something like having a bowl of water by your bedside and then occasionally dipping a flannel in that and draping that over your neck area. You might find that a little bit helpful. And then obviously, finally, just make sure that you're well hydrated during the day because that's going to help with heat stress too. So I think those are probably the main sleep-related ones. In terms of circadian biology ones, I think we can we can park time-restricted eating, but suffice it to say that for most people, an eight to 10-hour eating window is doable and slightly beneficial. I think the window can probably be as short as about six hours for people who are very interested in particular in losing some body fat. And it can be about as long as 12 hours for people who either struggle to maintain their weight or actively trying to gain weight while retaining their metabolic health. I would definitely finish the window at least two hours before you plan to go to bed. And I would distribute your protein intake relatively evenly across it. But I generally front load carbon fat intake within the window, but factor in your exercise. Because if you exercise late in the day, then that will have all sorts of beneficial metabolic effects that mean that it's fine to consume lots of your carbs and fats late in the day. Regarding caffeine, I think for most people, finish it at least nine hours before you go to bed. Alcohol earlier is better. And then finally, with respect to exercise, people are generally strongest and most powerful in the late biological afternoon, which for a lot of people is going to be about 5 to 6 p.m. or so. So some people would say that that's the ideal time of day at which to exercise, but you just have to do what makes sense in your schedule. And if you can only exercise early in the day, I'll just say that make sure you spend plenty of time warming up because probably the main reason why we're more powerful late in the day is that our body temperature, our core body temperature is higher at that time of day. And so you might just need a longer warm up to better match your performance to what it would be in the afternoon if you're working out early in the day. And I would, again, avoid very strenuous exercise too late in the day. And for that type of exercise, I would certainly finish it at least three hours before bed. The jury is still out on whether exercising late in the day does affect sleep. I just think that if it is strenuous enough, it's bound to. And obviously also when we exercise, we often do so in brightly lit gyms and so on. So we're getting other time cues that are going to shift our clocks and possibly disrupt sleep too. So I think that's a that's a reasonable starting point for a lot of people. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> that's an amazing uh, overview, and I definitely recommend people to like implement uh, this thing. And the circadian aspect is just very overlooked in my in, in my opinion for all aspects of like health. It's just uh, so uh, so important actually. Yeah, well, I appreciate you giving it so much attention. Team, we need people like you uh, spreading the word about the importance of this stuff because I think historically it's been so neglected. Mm, yeah absolutely and uh, yeah we'll probably do like a separate episode for the time machine eating uh, part and nutrition more uh, related to circadian rhythms uh, in the future but uh, yeah where can people find you and your work and like what your what are your main focuses uh, right now yeah so thanks for asking that i recently started my own podcast which is called reason and well-being and it's mostly focused on health and I actually have some upcoming episodes on circadian biology and sleep but so far it's focused mostly on things like habit formation and the importance of mental health brain health and i recently published a couple of episodes on low back pain too with Stu mcgill but we can find that by searching for that in any podcast provider and also videos of all the episodes and some other video content soon will go up on the youtube channel at greg potter phd and then otherwise, in terms of where to follow me, I'm on Instagram, at Greg Potter PhD there too. And regarding my work, obviously the podcast has taken some time recently and I'm really enjoying that so far, which is great. But I'm helping several startups at the moment, which are basically trying to help people improve their health and their performance at some scale, hopefully in the future at quite large scales. But I'm also doing some health coaching some of that is with the London Psychiatry Clinic here in the UK. And I'm still spending quite a lot of time 
working on developing different types of content for various people too. So sometimes that's podcasts, sometimes that's talks, sometimes those are online video courses too. So if anyone's interested in any of that stuff, then do feel free to reach out. And if anyone has any questions about what we've chatted about today too, then let us know. And, and maybe that's something we can pick up on next time. Yeah, sounds great. And yeah, thanks for coming to the podcast. Uh, we'll look look forward to the future episodes about the time machine eating. Fantastic. Thanks, Sim. But do you want to slow down aging and live longer? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details.